You can't? It's not allowed?
All right, good morning, Roots Church. We're going to get started here. Uh, I'm going to begin by reading from John 10, um, about uh, where Jesus says he is the good shepherd, which is a passage that's going to connect with um, our sermon today when we look at Psalm 23. So John 10, starting at verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So we're given a wonderful image um, of God's character. God is revealing himself, how we ought to think about him, um, who he actually is through uh, one of many images that we get in the Bible, but it's just an incredibly comforting one of God being a good and and uh, loving and servant-hearted shepherd to his sheep. So we're going to look at that more today, but let's begin uh, by singing a couple songs. as I am without one plea but that your blood was shed for me and that thou bids me come to thee just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to you whose blood can cleanse each spot Lamb of God I come I come Lamb of God I come Lamb of God I come of God I come just as I am though tossed about with many conflicts many doubts fights and fears within without as I am wretched blind sight and healing of the mind yeah all I need in you I'll find Lamb of God I come I come Lamb of God I come Lamb of God, I come, I come. Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, you will receive, will welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. Because you promise, I believe. Lamb of God, I come, I come. 
Lamb of God, I come. Lamb of God, I come, I come. Lamb of God, I come. Amen. Well, we read a confession each week uh, just to come to God, um, recognizing his promise that uh, when we come in faith, he, he receives us. Um, and it, it is that promise that, that acts as a very grace to us in giving us confidence to come in the first place. So we read a confession uh, just to confess our need and, um, um, and, and rely on, on God's grace. Let's read through this together. Lord Jesus, I have sinned times without number and been guilty of pride and unbelief and of neglect to seek you in my daily life. My sins and shortcomings present me with a list of accusations, but I thank you that they will not stand against me, for all have been laid on Christ. Deliver me from every evil habit, every interest of former sins, everything that dims the brightness of your grace in me, everything that prevents me taking delight in you. Amen. Dear refuge of my weary soul, on thee when sorrows rise, on thee when waves of trouble roll, my fainting hope relies. To thee I tell each rising grief, for thou alone canst heal. Thy word can bring a sweet relief for every pain I feel. But oh, in gloomy doubts prevail, I fear to call thee mine. The springs of comfort seem to fail, and all my hopes decline. Yet, gracious God, where shall I flee? Thou art my only trust, and still my soul would cleave to Thee, though prostrate in the dust. Hast thou not bid me seek thy face, and shall I seek in vain? And can the ear of sovereign grace be deaf when I complain? No, still the ear of sovereign grace attends the mourner's prayer. Oh, may I ever find access to breathe my sorrows there. Thy mercy seat is open still. Here let my soul retreat with humble hope attend thy will and wait beneath thy feet thy mercy seat is open still here let my soul retreat with humble hope attend thy will and wait beneath thy feet Amen. All right, we're going to read a, uh, a book for the children and for the children and all of us. We've got a great 
great book today. Um, it is by R.C. Sproul. It's called The Lightlings. Um, yeah, great book. Uh, just by, by the way, all these books that we've been doing, uh, we have here at the church. Um, I'll put them in the, the book stand out in the fellowship hall if you want to come by and check them out. Um, have them at home for a while and, and read them to your kids. Uh, feel free to come by or, or let me know. All right, the lightlings. One evening in a house in a quiet neighborhood, a little boy was getting ready for bed. The boy's name was Charlie Cobb. As his mother was tucking him in, she covered him with blankets to make him warm and cozy. She knelt by his bed and prayed with him. Then she stood, leaned over, and kissed his forehead. Charlie looked up at her and said, Mommy, please don't forget to turn on the nightlight before you leave my room. Mrs. Cobb smiled at him and said, Don't worry, sweetheart. I'll be sure to turn on the light. I won't leave you in the dark. So Charlie's mother gave him one last kiss, kiss, finished tucking him in, and turned on the nightlight next to his bed. Just as she was ready to leave, Charlie said, Mommy, why am I afraid of the dark? She said, That's a hard question to answer, Charlie. I think we're going to have to save that question for Grandpa. He's coming for dinner tomorrow. You can ask him then. All right, Mommy. Charlie said, I'll wait until tomorrow and ask Grandpa about it. The next day, just as Charlie's mother had promised, Grandpa came for dinner. Before they moved to the table, Charlie went and sat on Grandpa's knee and said, Grandpa, may I ask you a question that's really bothering me? Grandpa smiled and said, of course, Charlie. Tell me what, tell me what you'd like to know. Charlie said, Grandpa, why am I afraid of the dark? And why do so many people I know seem to be afraid of the dark, too? Grandpa looked at Charlie and said, That's a very good question. But you know, not only are lots of people afraid of the dark, many people are afraid of the light. Afraid of the light, said Charlie. Why would that be? Grandpa said, To understand that, I have to start at the beginning. In fact, at the very beginning. Charlie loved it when Grandpa told him stories. So he curled up next to Grandpa and waited for him to begin. Grandpa started his story the way he always did. Once upon a time, there was a great king who was the king of light. He lived in the light, he made the light, and his light was so perfect and so pure that he was called the king without a shadow. This great king of light made a group of people, and he made them so that they could shine brightly just as he did. He called them his little lightlings. He set the lightlings in a beautiful garden that he prepared for them, a garden that was full of bright sunshine. The sun bathed the garden every day and helped the flowers, plants, and fruit grow in great abundance. The bright light of the sun helped keep everyone warm in the garden. The lightlings loved it when the king came to visit them at the end of the day. But one day something terrible happened. The lightlings decided to do what they wanted to do, instead of what their king commanded them to do. So they disobeyed the king and sinned against him. The very moment they sinned, their lights became dim, and they were filled with shame and great embarrassment. They ran as fast as they could to get away from the king. They didn't want the king of light to see them. They ran out of the garden and into the woods and hid themselves in the darkest place they could find. From then on, they were afraid of the light, because they knew that where the light was, the king would be, and the king would see them in their shame. After the lightnings, lightlings left, the king began to remove his light from the garden. It soon became cold and covered with weeds, thorns, and sticky briars. The lightlings removed, moved further and further into the woods until they lived in a place that was almost completely covered in darkness. It was so dark, they had to grope around as if they were blind, feeling their way through the forest. Often they would trip and fall, scuffing their knees and bruising themselves. It was awful living in the dreadful darkness all the time, where the only light they ever saw was in barely lit shadows that danced in the forest. In fact, they couldn't tell the difference anymore between day and night. Then one night, or perhaps it was day, far off in the distance they saw a blinding light shining through the trees. They could see the light coming from miles and miles away. They were frightened by it. 
They thought the light meant that the king was coming to find them to punish them for their sins. So most of the lightlings began to stumble quickly away from the light. But some of the lightling children were so amazed by the light and curious about it that they decided to see from where it was coming. They set off and traveled for miles and miles. It took them a long time, but as they moved, they saw the light shining brighter and brighter. Finally, they came to a clearing in the forest. In the middle of the clearing, they saw a father lightning, lightling, a mother lightling, and a baby who was shining like the sun. The blazing light seemed to be coming right out of the baby himself. The lightlings who saw it were shocked and surprised. They asked the father lightling, who is this baby? Where did he come from? The father lightling answered, he is not my son. He is the son of the king of light. The king has given him to us as a special gift. He has been born for us. When he grows up, he will be called the light of the world. There will be no darkness strong enough to hide his light, no darkness deep enough to send his light away. When they heard this, the lightling children knelt down at the baby's feet and began to worship him in fear and reverence. When they stood up again, their own faces were shining, but the light that was shining in their faces was not coming from inside of them. It was a reflection of the light coming out of the baby. The lightlings were now surrounded with the light of the child they had visited. They rushed back to their homes, their friends, and their families as fast as their feet could carry them. When they got home, they were still shining. The other lightlings were frightened at the sight of them. They asked, what happened to you? So the lightling children told their story. We saw a baby who was shining with light. He is the son of the king. The king has given us a child. He has given us his own son to be the light of the world. The lightlings noticed that already there was more light in the forest. Now they could begin to see where they were going. They could walk without falling. They could run and play without bumping into trees or rocks and getting bruised. Some still hid from the light, but others realized they didn't need to be afraid anymore. They saw that living in the light was much better than the darkness they were used to. Grandpa looked at Charlie and said, You see, Charlie, we're afraid of the dark because we were made to live in the light. But someday all of us who love the sun will live with him forever in heaven. When we go to the dwelling place of the sun, who is now the light of the world, there will be no more darkness at all. Not only that, there will be no moon. There won't be any stars or even a sun. There'll be no night lights, no lamps, no lanterns, not even candles. Charlie asked, how can it be light if there's no sun or lamps or candles? How can that be? His father replied, in the place where the king's son now lives, the light that shines forever still comes from him. He is the light in heaven. All who come into his presence will never be in darkness again. Wow, Charlie said, that sure is a wonderful thing to look forward to. And Grandpa replied, Charlie, let me make a suggestion. Every time you see the sun, the moon, or the stars, or light a candle, or turn on your nightlight, remember of the story of the child the king of light brought into the darkness of this world. And remember that he gave us this baby as a present. As long as you remember that, you will never ever have to be afraid of the darkness again. All right. Just an awesome story of God's grand plan of salvation, um, of God's goodness and love in pursuing us, in loving us when we had turned away from him and, and were living in darkness as, as enemies, as set up as his enemies, that God came and gave himself for us. We're going to look at God's goodness and love and faithfulness to his people today, um, just reflect on these great truths of who God is. Uh, but before we do that, let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for being um, just greater than we can even comprehend. We thank you that your ways are above our ways, your thoughts are above our thoughts. We thank you that you are not completely like us, 
that you were set apart and distinct and, and above and, and greater in every way. Your goodness and love is, is greater than ours. Your justice and, and holiness and righteousness is greater than ours. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. And thank you for loving us. Thank you for calling us to yourself. Thank you for coming to us and not waiting for us to come to you, but coming to us in the person of Jesus. And through his life, death, and resurrection, drawing us to yourself. Thank you, Lord, for overcoming our our sin, our waywardness, our rebellion, opening our, our blind eyes, our deaf ears, awakening our hearts that we might know you. Oh Lord, show us your goodness and love again and again. Today, especially, just want to pray for the many mothers in our congregation, many mothers listening right now. Thank you for mothers. Thank you for the, um, just the picture we get of your love for us, of your selfless um, servant-hearted, humble, enduring, faithful love for us that we see um, in all mothers. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a picture of of your faithfulness and love for us. Uh, We pray that you would give the mothers in in our church um, strength and endurance, especially in this time when there are extra stresses, extra responsibilities um, on them. We pray that you would just sanctify them and, and uh, draw them to yourself, draw them to your word, draw them to hope in you, uh, to seek you in prayer. Uh, may, may they see you at work in them uh, in difficult times, in, in, in times of uh, comfort, in, in all times. Lord, would you be working and drawing them to yourself and sanctifying them, strengthening them, encourage them. I pray that you give them joy in, in their mothering, in their work. Let them see some of the fruit of, of their labors and um, just have joy in that. Lord, may the, the mothers in our church be uh, encourage one another. Would you enable them to just be as iron that sharpens iron, uh, to show grace and forgiveness to one another, to speak truth to one another, to exhort and encourage and, 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 and help one another press on in this great endeavor of mothering. Help them to find their identity in you and not in their mothering. Help them to know their, their worth and the hope that they have in you and be able to selflessly love their, their children. Also, just want to pray for the marriages in our church, that you would strengthen them, um, build them up, draw husbands and wives towards one another to understand one another better, to, to pursue one another and enjoy one another, to forgive and show grace to one another as they, as they experience your grace and forgiveness, to bear with one another and um, in, in just grace and forgiveness. Let husbands and wives be humble and, and quick to acknowledge and, and repent of sin and, and selfishness. To not see their spouse's faults as greater than their own, but being able to fully own up to their own. Um, rest in your grace and not find their identity in um, being the perfect husband or wife, but find their identity in you. We thank you for the gift of, of, of mothers and of fathers and, of, and the gift of marriage. I just ask that, you, again, that you would strengthen the marriages in our church. Thank you for this time to, to dive into your word together. Speak to us. Open our eyes to see yourself, to see your character, to see your goodness, love, and faithfulness. Oh God, may your word come as a hammer that breaks the rock. May it come with power and conviction, and encouragement, and hope. Draw us to yourself, O Lord. Draw us to yourself. May your word bear fruit. May you build us up as individuals, as a church, for your glory and our good. 
In your name, amen. Well, I want to begin just by reading through Psalm 23. We're going to be in Psalm 23 today, six verses. I want to begin just by reading the whole thing through, and then we'll work through it. Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, God has given us the Bible. God has given us his word so that we might know him. All throughout the Bible, we see that God has this purpose in mind, that that we, that his people, that humanity would know him. Uh, We see him revealing himself through words, speaking, revealing himself through events, acting in certain ways. We see him calling people into a relationship with himself. We see him going to great lengths to overcome the sin that keeps us from coming into a relationship with himself. And then we see him coming to the earth in the person of Jesus so that we might get a clearer picture of his character, of what he's like, so that we might know him. And Jesus at one point says clearly, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. God's purpose is not just that we would find eternal life. It's not even just that we would live good moral lives. His purpose is that we would know him. And we can. This is possible. We can know God and we can know what he's like. God has given us the Bible and he's given us Jesus so that we can know him. Think about it. In our possession, we have the ability to come to know the character of God, the will of God, the ways of God, the purposes of God. If we want to get to know him, we simply open up our Bibles and we can know God. Too often we approach the Bible just asking the question, what do I need to do? What does God want from me? As if it was all about us. As if all that God cared about was how we behave. That matters, but the first question we must ask and continue to ask is, who is God? All of the rest matters very little if we don't know who God is. The heart of Christianity is a personal relationship with our creator God, grounded in his love for us. And so this psalm before us today, the well-known Psalm 23, gives us a, a wonderful glimpse into the character of God. Uh, Psalm 23 gives us a couple images to, to help us understand who God is. It draws from a couple roles within um, human existence that God chooses to help us, to help communicate his character. So we see God as a good shepherd first, and then we see God as a hospitable host. And as we reflect on these and reflect on what we have here in Psalm 23, we're, we're given a glimpse, we're, we're allowed to behold the, the character of God. So we're just going to walk through this basically one phrase at a time and just try to mine the depths of, of this um, section of God's word uh, that he's given us that we might know him. So starting in verse 1, we're given an image of God as a good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. David, the author, writes, confesses, the Lord is my shepherd. This is a theme that you find throughout Scripture. God is a shepherd. Uh, In the book of Ezekiel, at one point, God calls out the human leaders of his people um, as failed shepherds. They are feeding themselves and not the sheep or the people. They're not defending and protecting the people, but letting them 
run off and get eaten by prey. They're, they're not caring for the weak ones and the sick and the, um, the maimed and the lost. And as a result, in Ezekiel 34, God says that he will search for his sheep. He says, as a shepherd seeks out his flock, I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered. I will feed them with good pasture. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will, myself will make them lie down. So, so God is saying that he will ensure that his people are well cared for. He will become their shepherd. Even if human leaders fail, he will ensure that his people are cared for. A few hundred years later, Jesus comes along and says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and they know me. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. So Jesus confirms that God is like a good and caring shepherd of his people. Jesus is the perfect image of God and presents himself as this good shepherd. Now, this imagery or this idea of God as shepherd has at least three um, components to it. First, like a real shepherd cares for his sheep, God cares for his people. He sees that they have what they need. He sees that they're well fed. Uh, He cares for them. Secondly, like a good shepherd protects his flock, God protects his people. He defends them, protects them. And then thirdly, like a a good shepherd guides the sheep, um, leads them, guides them to good pasture and to to safety. So God leads and guides his people um, into all that is good and safe. In this way, the, the role of a a shepherd or this good shepherd imagery is, is, a, is a helpful picture of servant leadership, right? So the shepherd is in charge of the sheep. He's, he's the leader. But as a leader, he cares deeply for them. He's serving them. He has their good in mind. He's even willing to give his life to protect the sheep. So think about this for a moment. Is this the God that you know? When you think of God, do you think of him? Do you see him as a good shepherd who cares for you, who protects and defends you, who is leading you to what you need and to what is good? Or do you, do you doubt this? Are there ways in which you, you disbelieve that God truly cares for you, that God has your good in mind? Do you think that God is withholding good from you. Thinking wrong thoughts about God is no light thing. It's of utmost importance that we assess our view of God in light of scripture, in light of who he's revealed himself to be, that we think of him rightly. Uh, This is something that we, we do for all of our lives. It's a refining process, surely, throughout all of our lives, but it's an incredibly important process and it's something we must be diligent at. For example, if you disbelieve that God is good, it will affect your ability to trust in him. If you disbelieve that God is just and righteous, it will affect your commitment to justness and righteousness. It will make you think less of God. And willingly thinking wrong thoughts about God is is a form of idolatry, is essentially worshiping a false god. So we must endeavor to know God as he is, as he's revealed himself to be. And we see one of the important implications of why this matters so much in the very next phrase. In verse 1, David goes on, knowing what God is like, he proclaims, I shall not want. If God is like a good shepherd, caring for us, protecting us, defending us, um, leading us into all that is good, one of the results is that we can be content in him, satisfied, happy. We can say that we are blessed no matter what is going on in our life. It's kind of like the confidence that um, children of of good and loving parents can have in, in their parents. They don't know how all of their needs are being met. They don't know where money comes from. They don't even perhaps really know what money is. 
They don't understand all of the details, but they do know their parents. They know the faithfulness and love. They know the character of their parents. Similarly, we can be satisfied and happy and restful as people of God, not because we know exactly how he's going to provide everything, not because we know exactly how he's working, but because we know him. We know his his love and his goodness and his faithfulness to his people. Oftentimes, we, we have peace, not because we actually trust God, but because we simply trust our likelihoods or chances or our ability to control situations. What happens when the chances aren't that great? What happens when we know that things are out of our control? When things don't happen as we expect, when the normal means of provisions fail, when you're living paycheck to paycheck. What happens then? I find that God often brings us to a place where we don't know where provision will come, f- where provision will come from to, to teach us to know that it is, to teach us to trust in him. And not in systems or people or, or likelihoods. And he does this because he not only wants to provide for us and care for us and protect us and lead us. He wants us to know that it is him caring for us, protecting us, and leading us. He doesn't want us to just know his gifts. He wants us to know him. He wants us to be satisfied in him. David goes on in verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. So one of the characteristics of poetry like this is uh, it often gives a, a, an overall impression. So the words matter and they mean something, but sometimes what is more meaningful is just the overall impression you get from reading a, a section of poetry. Poetry, And here we're given an impression of, of rest and refreshment and peace. Think of the importance of green pastures and still waters to sheep. It's exactly what they need. It's all that they need. God's leading is exactly what we need. It's restorative to our souls. Life under his rule, life submitting to him, is, is good for us at the deepest level. Uh, Charles Spurgeon says about this verse, when the soul grows sorrowful, he revives it. When it is sinful, he sanctifies it. When it is weak, he strengthens it. He does it. His ministers could not do it if he did not. His word would not avail by itself. He restores a soul. Do, do you see what he's saying? It's not just a function of of our engagement with one another, though that may be a means. It's not just a function of his word operating apart from him, although he does work through his word. But through these things and through other ways, God himself restores our souls. Do you care about rest and peace and joy and refreshment and restoration. Of of course you do. We all do. Know that God cares about these things too. These are good God-given desires. He restores my soul. Now, the next couple of phrases provide some clarification to this. Verse 3, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So there's nothing wrong with seeking rest and peace and refreshment and joy. But there is something wrong in seeking these things as ends in themselves. That's what the Bible calls idols. And so right in parallel to the claim that God is leading us in soul restorative ways, we are told that God is leading us in righteousness. The way of peace and rest is the way of righteousness. That that is living under the right rule of God, living in his ways. 
The way of soul refreshment is the way of submission to God's rule. They're one and the same. You don't ignore God and the way that he says life ought to be lived and and find peace, rest, and joy. They are found in God. What does Jesus say? Come to me who all who are weary and I will give you rest. Furthermore, we, we see that God's leading is for his name's sake. So while God is working for the good of his people, while God truly, deeply loves his people, this isn't because we are utmost in his thoughts. This isn't because we are the most important thing in his mind. This isn't because God has submitted himself to our every desire. No, the picture that the Bible gives us is that God's ultimate end is his own glory, the display of his greatness and goodness and love. John Piper, if you know anything about John Piper, uh, basically says this in everything he writes. Uh, in, In his book, Desiring God, he writes, When we do ask about God's design, we are too prone to describe it with ourselves at the center of God's affections. But God's savings designs are penultimate, not ultimate. Redemption, salvation, and restoration are not God's ultimate goal. These he performs for the sake of something greater, namely, the enjoyment he has in glorifying himself. And so this is what makes the Christian discussion of things like peace and rest and restoration and and soul care and joy so much different from the world's discussion of these things. It's not that these things, it's not that happiness matters most and maybe God can help, help us a little bit with that. It's that God matters most and there is happiness in him. Pursue happiness by all means, but pursue it um, not as an end in itself, but in knowing your creator God. And this happiness that we find in him is, is possible in all circumstances, in all times, which is what David says next in verse four. It says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So if your experience of rest and and peace and joy is at all dependent on situations or on other people, it will be unstable. Because we will go through valleys, we will experience the shadow that death casts over life. We will deal with evil people and evil systems. This is just a part of life. But if our confidence and if our rest is found in God and his character, his promises, his presence with us, then it's stable and secure through all times. If this is to be the case, we must not judge and interpret God by our momentary experiences, but judge and interpret our experiences by the the eternal and unchanging God in his word. Now, this doesn't mean our our experiences or our feelings don't, doesn't mean they don't matter. It just means that we aren't infallible interpreters of what they mean. We, we are limited in our understanding. We don't see all that God is doing. We don't see the end of things, at least not perfectly. And so as we go through various times where our experiences or feelings tell us one thing, we cling to God and his word which is what David does. He cries out, you are with me. Um, God is a personal God whom we, who we can speak to personally. Uh, we can not only know what he is like from a distant, from the third person, we can speak to him in the first person. We can cry out to him. You are with me. Uh, the image here seems to be one of, of sheep going through a a, a dark and dangerous valley where there may be wolves or other dangers and them being protected by the shepherd's rod and staff. This would normally be a very frightening situation, but they are at peace. They are at rest because of the presence of the shepherd. Do you realize that God is with you like this? That in the midst of dangers and evils and uncertainties and fears and temptations, that you're not alone. 
if you have trusted Christ as Savior and Lord, that his spirit is with you, he is leading you, he is guiding you, he is working all things together for good, he is strengthening you, and he will sustain you to the end. David then shifts um, metaphors in the last two verses. So we see that God is a good shepherd. And then in the last two verses, we see that God is like a hospitable host. Verse five, you prepare a table before me. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. So even though this is a new metaphor, um, notice that God is still presented as a um, as lovingly serving his people. He's not presented as the guest of honor at the head of the table whom all must uh, serve, although that would be appropriate image of God as well. But here he presents himself as a host showing honor and richly blessing his people. Uh, so anointing heads with oil was a sign of showing honor. An overflowing cup is a sign of uh, richly blessing and, and provision. Again, we're given a picture of God as, of, as one who works for the good and joy and delight of his people. It is good for the people of God to be with God, sitting at the table with him. The image here is even more striking as this is done in full view of those who want to harm David. He says, you do this in the, in the presence of my enemies. Even in the midst of enemies or, or things like chaos and suffering and, and uncertainty, the most important and weighty factor in our lives is that God is a God who richly blesses us. That we have a God who will vindicate his people and vindicate his own glory, vindicate his purposes. That we have a God who knows and determines the true end and meaning of all things. That's what matters most. And so no matter what your situation, no matter what you feel, no matter what you're going through, hope and rest in the ultimate victory and rule of God. David then ends with a fitting summary to this psalm in verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Uh, so the word translated mercy here is the Hebrew word hesed, which you may have heard of before. It's often translated as steadfast love. It's an important word in the Bible. The word translated follow is a little more active than our English word conveys. It's more like pursue or track down. And so David pictures God's love and steadfast love in hot pursuit of him, following him wherever he goes. Consider with this the, the earlier idea of God leading his people. So God being ahead of his people. And then we have God with, David says, you are with me. God with his people, being besides them. And then here we have God following us. And so the overall picture is of God completely surrounding his people, before, behind, and on the sides. Like a shepherd with his sheep, God is completely in tune with us, with our needs, with what's going on in our lives. He's one step ahead of us if there's danger. He's with us as we're walking through difficulties, and he's behind us if we stray or lag behind. If you belong to God through repentance and faith, God is absolutely committed to you. Now, when you put all this together, you get an incredibly comforting picture of the character of God. I see at least 11 truths proclaimed here, 11 truths about God's character. And we'll put these up on the screen. We see that God satisfies his people. God protects his people. God richly provides for his people. God comforts his people. God leads his people in what is right. God dwells with his people. God defends and vindicates his people. God serves his people. God honors his people. God nourishes his people. 
and God commits himself to his people. If this is who God is, good, loving, faithful, how should we respond? What is the appropriate response? I think David gets it exactly right in the second half of verse 1. I shall not want. Satisfaction, contentment, peace, rest, happiness, true blessedness. How could we be dissatisfied if this is who God is to us? St. Augustine writes, You have made us for yourself, O God, and our heart is restless until it finds rest in you. True rest is found in God because he is our greatest good. Now, in thinking about this, in, in considering what we've looked at today, there is a temptation, which I hinted at before, of responding like, okay, God is good and loving and faithful, He's forgiving, cares about my happiness and rest, these things that I care about. That's great. I, I guess I can get on with my life, M- maybe pay some attention to God, maybe not, because, well, he, he'll, he's understanding and forgiving. In other words, there's temptation to interpret God's willingness to serve us as a sign of our goodness rather than his goodness, as a sign of our greatness and worth rather than a sign of his greatness and worth. But remember, this is all for his name's sake. This is not God submitting himself to us, losing himself for us, conforming his desires and will to ours. Yes, God is humble and servant-hearted, but he is also the king of kings, the one who deserves all praise and glory and devotion and, and obedience and submission. Furthermore, right alongside all of these aspects of God's character that we've looked at today, we also find that God is holy and righteous and just, committed to holiness and righteousness and justice, and that we are unholy and wicked and unjust. That our sin has cut us off from God's favor and forgiveness. In Scripture, where we learn about these, the wonderful love and goodness of God, we also learn that our sin and rebellion has kept us from experiencing the goodness and love of God kept us from rejoicing in the very truths of this psalm. So we need a good God, yes, but we need this good God to do us something about our sin. It's not enough to simply say that God is good. And so Jesus comes as a perfect representation of God, the perfect image of God. We see all of these truths of God's character in Jesus. Go read John 10, where Jesus, what we read earlier, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. We see all of these things. Jesus is God. And yet Jesus doesn't just say, yep, this is who God is. He's good and loving and faithful. Don't worry about anything. Just rest easy. God is good. That's all you need to know. No, Jesus comes and says, the son of man, which is Jesus, must suffer many things and be rejected and killed and rise three days later. Jesus demonstrates that he is the ultimate good shepherd who cares for and protects and defends his people by giving his life for his people, dying in their place for their sin. We must not only see who God is, we must see that, we must must see, not only see who God is, good, loving, just, and righteous, but also that because of who God is, flowing out of who he is, he came in the person of Jesus to bring sinners into his fold. Jesus is the way that we become a part of the flock of God. Jesus is the way that we sit at the table of the hospitable host. Jesus is the promise that we, be, that we are among the people of God, the promise that we can joyfully proclaim the truth of this psalm. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so with faith firmly in God, the good shepherd, with faith firmly in Jesus who gave himself for us. Let us confess and continue to confess these words. The Lord is my shepherd. 
I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Let's pray. O Lord, satisfy us. Grant us faith to cling to you, to know you. Would you satisfy us with yourself? As we face the ups and downs of life, as we face pain, questions, uncertainty, suffering, loss, may you truly be our rock and fortress, our place of refuge, and may we have an abiding joy and satisfaction and happiness in you. In your name, amen. All right, we're going to respond with a couple songs um, that just help us process and, and rejoice in the truths that we just heard. Jesus said that if I thirst, I should come to him. No one else can satisfy, I should come to him. Jesus said if I am weak, I should come to him. No one else can be my strength, I should come to him. For the Lord is good and faithful, he will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong and kind. Jesus said that if I fear, I should come to him. No one else can be my shield, I should come to him. For the Lord is good and faithful, he will keep us day and night. Jesus, Jesus strong and kind. Jesus said, if I am lost, he will come to me. And he showed me on that cross, he will come to me. For the Lord is good and faithful, he will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong and kind for the Lord. For the Lord is good and faithful, keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong and kind, Jesus strong and kind, Jesus
Jesus, strong and kind. In tenderness he sought me. Weary and sick with sin, and on his shoulders brought me back to his fold again. While angels in his presence sang, until the courts of heaven rang, oh, the love that sought me. Oh, the blood that bought me, oh, the grace that brought me to the fold of God. Grace that brought me to the fold of God. He died for me while I was sin, needy and poor and blind. Whisper to assure me, I found thee, thou art mine. I never heard a sweeter voice, it made my aching heart rejoice. Oh, the love that sought me, oh, the blood that bought me grace that brought me to the fold of God. Grace that brought me to the fold of God. Upon His grace I'll daily ponder and sing anew His praise. With all adoring wonder his blessings I retrace. It seems as if eternal days are far too short to sing His praise. Oh, the love that sought me, oh, the blood that bought me, oh, the grace that brought me to the fold of God. Grace that brought me to the fold of God. Amen. Let me read a benediction from 1 Peter 5. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Uh, our men's and women's studies continue this week. Men's on Mondays at 7 and Tuesdays on... Uh, Tuesdays on... Women on Tuesdays at 7. Uh, over Zoom. Um, more information on our website. And then I sent out an email this week just with a couple things in it just that I'll highlight briefly. Um, we, we laid out a, a plan for, for reopening in line with the, the governor's four-phase plan. Uh, so perhaps June 16th at the earliest, we will be able to, to gather again um, as gatherings of 50 and under are uh, able to uh, happen then um, to make sure that we're under that uh, limit. We will be having two services at that time, 
and um, we'll have have people sign up online um, just so that we are, are are spread out over those two services. We will have nursery for the young, real young ones, but um, otherwise families will just be sitting together. Uh, we love having the kids in here and having families together. Um, so hopefully that lasts for just three weeks, and then by July 7th at the earliest, these dates could change, but at the earliest July 7th, um, we can uh, all come back together and um, in one service. So that's kind of the, the big picture. Uh, we'll put uh, that information on the website. And then the other thing I mentioned in the email is just that we've set up a benevolence fund. If you would like to, to give um, above and beyond your, your, your normal tithes to a benevolence fund to help um, families specifically in need, just to, for us to have that ability to, to help when um, needs come up in the church or perhaps in the wider community, um, you can do that. Just mark benevolence fund and um, we'll make sure that gets to the right spot. That's all. We'll see you next week.